Hello everybody, welcome to Open Conversation. Um, for those of you who haven't been before, this is the last one of this semester, but we have a talk once a month on the first Wednesday of the month on something usually vaguely astronomical. Today it's more physics than astronomy. Um, this week, uh, this month we have uh, one of our graduate students, Zach Buck, and he's going to tell us about how fabulous he comes to and what he uses the book. Take it away. Thank you, Dr. Speck. Um, my name is Zach Buck, and I'm a graduate student here at the University of Physics, or University of Missouri Physics Department. And a lot of my research involves neutron scattering. So today I'm going to talk to you about the applications of neutron scattering and the techniques used to help us advance our understanding of complex materials. And just like every presentation I give, I start with an outline, start with the basics, explain what a neutron is, give you a little bit of a history lesson of how it's discovered. We'll move on to the production of neutrons for experimental purposes, and then we'll jump into the concepts. And I'll talk about neutron scattering and how it compares to other scattering techniques, specifically x-rays. Um, now I'll move on to what kinds of neutron experiments are available and the instruments that are used to help you uh, obtain data. And then I'll talk about my research and my experience with neutron scattering. So jumping in, um, start with a history lesson first. Uh, the discovery of the neutron started back in 1920 with this gentleman, Ernest Rutherford. He postulated the existence of the neutron and he had good reason to believe that there would be, a, there has to exist a neutron. And it originates from the idea that the, at the time they observed atomic nuclei to possess more mass than their own good. Essentially, uh, atoms, their nucleus, uh, had more mass than the number of protons that should be in that nucleus. Uh, years later, this uh, German physicist uh, brought uh, he and his student, Becker, they bombarded alpha particles, which is, uh, an alpha particle is the nucleus of a helium atom. So they bombarded these alpha particles at an element beryllium, and as a result, it released what they call neutral radiation. And at the time, they thought that this radiation could be gamma rays. And a gamma ray is a highly energized particle of light. And so they carried on this belief for a while, trying to pinpoint exactly what's going on here. And then in 1932, uh, Irene and Frederick Curie used uh, Frost method to bombard um, paraffin with these neutral uh, radiations. And they found out that uh, it would release protons, which was inconsistent with the idea that it could be gamma rays, this radiation could be gamma rays. Uh, through momentum and energy conservation analysis, uh, you can prove that gamma rays do not have enough energy to release protons from this paraffin wax that they were using. And the same year, James Chadwick came around and he took this neutral radiation, he aimed it at a bunch of different types of atoms. He looked at nitrogen and carbon, helium and argon, and by comparing the energies of recoiled particles from the different targets, he determined that this neutral radiation was actually a particle and it possessed mass, and this mass became, it was very close to the mass of the proton. And so this was the discovery of the neutron, and he called it the neutron, and just three years later he won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Now, keeping with the basics here, what is a neutron? A neutron is a subatomic particle and it has no net charge, and it lives in the nucleus of atoms. And an atom is made up of a positively charged nucleus, and it has negatively charged electrons that orbit it. And this neutron is similar in size and mass to the proton, and the amount of neutrons in the nucleus of atoms determines what isotope it is. Uh, now, atoms, they have like three varieties. They, so, the number of protons in an atom determines the element, the number of neutrons in the atom determines the isotope, and the number of electrons in an atom determines the ion. And this will become a little important later when I discuss concepts of neutron scattering. It has a lot to do with different types of isotopes. But uh, the important thing is that an isotope has to do with the number of neutrons in an atom. Typically, you look at the periodic table of any of the elements, they should have you know, they, they should have uh, the same number of electrons as they do protons as they do neutrons. So to give you a little bit of an appreciation of how small these particles are, 
if you were to take the hydrogen atom, which is just a proton orbited by a single electron, and you were to magnify it, and it scaled up to about the size of the Earth, and you would find that the proton would be about the size of a basketball that sits in the center of the Earth, and the orbiting electron would be out in the atmosphere somewhere. And this is just uh, remarkable because most of matter is just empty. So that, uh, and so this should give you a little bit of an appreciation uh, to how tiny these particles are that we're talking about. And again, the proton and the neutron are about the same size. Uh, so how can we produce neutrons for experimental purposes? Um, before I talk to you about the production of neutrons, I just want to give you a little bit of motivation, and hopefully by the end of the, this talk, you'll be convinced that neutrons can help you understand a lot of different types of materials. And it touches every uh, area of science and engineering, from biology, to chemistry, to physics, material science, and then it spills over to engineering, but possibilities are really the sky's limit with the neutrons. So how do you produce neutrons for research? Uh, there's two main ways you can do it. You could uh, produce neutrons in the cores of nuclear reactors, or you can produce neutrons through uh, something called spallation. Um, on the left here is an image of the University of Missouri research reactor, which is just two miles away from here, it's just south of campus on Providence. And in the blue building there, that's the containment building. That's where the nuclear reactor is housed. Um, on the right is an image of the spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Oak Ridge is in Tennessee, it's just uh, north of Knoxville. And um, they both produce neutrons in these, these uh, research facilities, but they do it at different points. So I'll start with the nuclear reactions first. Now, a nuclear reaction relies on a chain reaction of fission events of uranium-235. And fission is seen in this figure down here in the bottom right corner, where you have a neutron, it's incident uh, on a nuclei, in this case it's uranium-235. The uranium nuclei captures this neutron, and it becomes unstable, doesn't like its state, and it splits off into two separate nuclei, and in the process it releases energy in the form of heat and uh, other neutrons. Now, these neutrons that are created are slowed down with something that's called a moderator, which is usually water, or uh, which is H2O. Sometimes it's D2O, and sometimes it's liquid hydrogen. And D2O is referred to as heavy water. It's kind of the same thing as water, but not really. Um, the water molecule is one oxygen and two hydrogens, but this D2O is an oxygen and two deuterium. And deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen. It's the same element, has the same number of protons in the nucleus, but deuterium is just a hydrogen atom with a neutron in the nucleus now. Um, and all three of these are used at different places to moderate the neutrons, which slows them down. Uh, eventually, the neutrons make their way out of this core, and they find them their way into beam lines, which uh, guide them to instruments and scientists awaiting to use them to do an experiment. And nuclear reactors are often called uh, steady sources, which means that there's flux of neutrons with respect to time doesn't change. And this flux of neutrons is the amount of neutrons that are incident on some area in some amount of time. Um, and on the left here is a picture of the high flux isotope reactor uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab, um, which is in Tennessee. And now, I want to mention something about this moderator. There's, there's a couple reasons you want to slow the neutrons down. Uh, first of all, when the neutrons are released or liberated from these uh, fission events, they possess a great amount of energy, a tremendous amount. And you can't use these neutrons for experiments, and you'll see why later. Um, so they need to be slowed down, and they're slowed down through this moderator, through collisions of, with uh, hydrogen nuclei in the water and so forth. Um, but there's another reason that you want to slow these neutrons down, and it has something to do with cross-section. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more in detail on this later, but I need to introduce this idea to you now. And uh, uranium has what's called an absorption cross-section. And the cross-section is just an area, a neutron can see this area and interact with it. And if a neutron sees this absorption cross-section, it will be captured by the uranium atom and undergo fission. But these absorption cross-sections are actually dependent on the neutron's energy. And it just so happens that if the neutron has a lot of energy, uh, the absorption cross-sections 
of nuclei get smaller. And so the probability that you have a fission event is much lower when you have really fast neutrons because they don't see the uranium nuclei. So you need to slow them down. When you slow them down, they begin to see these cross-sections. And so the probability of continuing this chain reaction increases. So that's another reason you want to slow them down. Um, that's kind of like a uh, phenomenon of it in nuclear reactions is this radiation called Chankov radiation. And it's electromagnetic radiation <coughs> emitted from charged particles, uh, in this case the electrons, but it's electromagnetic radiation that's emitted from charged particles that are moving faster than the speed of light in the medium. Now I'm not saying that the particles themselves move faster than this uh, universal speed limit C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, but the speed of light changes when it goes through different mediums. So in vacuum, it's, it's maximum, but in water, it's a lot less. And this is um, necessary to emit this radiation. So an electron on a very short time scale and on very short distances will move faster than the speed of light in that medium. Uh, on the left there is an uh, image of the Cherenkov radiation in the University of Missouri research reactors core. Um, and all research reactors, uh, or just reactors in general, will produce this blue glow. On the right is the uh, advanced test reactor located at Idaho National Lab. And then on the bottom is an electron outrunning a uh, beam of light. And then, okay, spallation neutron sources. A little different than uh, uh, nuclear reactors. Spallation neutron sources rely on the ejection of neutrons from a target nucleus, kind of similar, but it doesn't involve any fission. The, these target nuclei are not structuring. Um, instead, protons are incident on a target nuclei. Uh, it becomes unstable, but it doesn't uh, split into two. It just releases a bunch of neutrons and, and protons and, and maybe a gamma ray or something also. Um, and the gamma ray is a high energy particle. <coughs> Spallation is achieved by accelerating protons to great speeds and having them collide with a nucleus. The result is the liberation of neutrons with varying energies in the form of pulses. And this figure down here on the uh, right, um, in the red here you see these spikes, these cone, these cone looking kind of things. This is uh, flux versus time. And like I said, the neutron or uh, the nuclear reactor is a steady state source, so flux doesn't change with time. That's the blue straight line there. But at a spallation source, your neutrons are delivered in pulses, and so their flux does change with time. Now, the liberation of neutrons are then exposed to a moderator, and for the same reasons, uh, you want to slow them down so you can use them for experiments because their energy is too high, but they're not undergoing any uh, fission events, so you don't have to worry about really the absorption cross sections too much. Not as, not as much as a nuclear reactor. But um, they also eventually make their way into beam lines and down to instruments. So here's a little schematic of the Spallation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, the, up here, this is where it all starts. Protons, um, you have ionized hydrogen. You, you actually start out with a uh, proton with two orbiting electrons. And they shoot these, these ionized hydrogens down this beam line here where then the electrons are stripped off and the proton continues on into that accumulator ring where it begins to accelerate really close to the speed of light, something like 90%, if not a little more. And it punches up with other, with other protons that are in there circulating and accelerating. And when the time's right, these bunches of protons are launched into this target. And this target is liquid mercury, for, for this case. In the previous slide, sometimes they use lead. But uh, at Oak Ridge here, in their solution source, they use liquid mercury. And they can control the frequency at which they shoot these protons into this target. And here they do 60 hertz. So 60 times a second, bunches of protons are incident on a mercury nucleus and uh, collide with that, and it releases a bunch of neutrons, which we can use. And this uh, table on the bottom here, I keep talking about energies of neutrons. There's kind of three regimes here, and we go from cold, thermal, and hot. Hot neutrons are the neutrons that are created right after a uh, fission event or something. They have extremely high energies, which means they have very uh, small wavelengths, too, too small to be used. Um, where we want to be is in the thermal uh, region, 
And these energies are comparable to excitations in matter, and the wavelengths are almost the same size as distances between atoms in matter, and these are the conditions that actually need to be met in order to use neutrons for experiments. So that's where we want to be. Um, concepts of neutron scattering and how it compares to other techniques. Okay, so if you haven't already adopted the idea that particles are waves and waves are particles, now the time they need to accept this. Uh, it's kind of a universal fact now. We've, we've uh, come up with other ways to developing equations that explain this, and uh, the math actually is a lot easier when you're dealing with weight rather than how it got number of particles. But waves behave like particles, and particles behave like waves. And a really uh, important equation that kind of pulls this together is known as the de Broglie wavelength. And this is Louis de Broglie. He won the Nobel Prize in 1929 for uh, the development of this. And it relates the wavelength of a particle, that's this lowercase lambda, um, to the momentum of the particle, which is p. And momentum is a mass times a velocity. And the h is Planck's constant. And that's a universal constant. Okay. And so you can relate wavelength to momentum of particles. And for example, there's a classic case uh, if you look up the mass of a regulation size baseball, it's like 0 0.147 kilograms. And you give this to a major league pitcher, he throws a set to at 100 miles an hour, and you do this calculation, you'll find that that baseball possesses a wavelength of 1 times 10 to the minus 34, which is incredibly small, uh, an immeasurably small. And the radius of an electron is on the order of uh, femtometer, which is 10 to the minus 15, that's a uh, millionth of a billion of a meter, and that's the size of an electron. Now try measuring 10 to the minus 34 meters, you just can't do it. But it's there, and we accept it, and you need to accept it too. And then here's a picture of a particle arguing with Erwin Schrodinger, who's there uh, made a big impact on uh, wave mechanics and quantum mechanics and physics, um, that he didn't think he had to work with this wave, but they're uh, not separable. You've got to deal with the both. So electromagnetic radiation. Um, we're all really familiar with electromagnetic radiation. Uh, you use it to see. Uh, for humans, I mean, we, we see uh, anywhere from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. Uh, and a nanometer is a, a billionth of a meter. Um, and this is the visible spectrum. We call it visible spectrum for us. Uh, but even objects that have a temperature, they emit electromagnetic radiation. It's all around you. Um, and it turns out that if you're trying to probe an atomic structure, you need to use uh, electromagnetic radiation that has wavelengths that are comparable to the size of the atoms. And so if you look up here, the atom sits there at an x-ray, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters. We call that an angstrom. And so x-rays are a good tool to study nanomaterials because of this fact that they have wavelengths that are comparable to the size of that. And it, they are. We use them all the time for nanomaterials and uh, in, the med in the medical field as well. And an e and wave is this oscillating electric field coupled with an oscillating magnetic field. But that interacts with the electrons of an atom. And this is fine. We use it all the time. You guys, uh, almost every university in the country has probably got uh, an x-ray machine, an x-ray refraction machine or something. But uh, there's a couple of drawbacks with this. Because it interacts with the electron cloud of atoms, you can't see lighter elements like hydrogen or carbon or oxygen, biologically relevant elements, because they don't have a lot of electrons. Hydrogen's got one electron. Um, and, and so it's difficult for x rays to uh, see this. Not only that, but uh, the question of contrast comes up. Say you have a sample that has. To say it's, it's made up of elements that actually sit next to each other on a periodic table. Or in other words, they, it's made up of elements that have a similar number of electrons. It's hard to interpret your data if you're scattering from elements that almost appear the same to x-rays. Um, so it's not easy to interpret data. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy to interpret neutron data either, but it's, it's not, it's, it's different. So, okay, here, yeah, you've probably done some example in a uh, x-ray experiment. Maybe not an experiment, but a measurement. Uh, X-rays are taking all the time in the medical field, so these are called radiographs. 
So advantages of using neutrons. The first one is that uh, neutrons interact only with the nucleus, uh, which allows us to see these lighter elements, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, because uh, neutrons, they don't care about how many electrons are in your sample. They only care about uh, the nucleus, and every atom has a nucleus. And because you can see these lighter elements, these hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, you can study biological materials now, because bio in biology, we're all made up of carbon, and oxygen, and hydrogen, and all these lighter elements. So it's, it's a good idea now to use neutron scattering for that. Um, something I haven't mentioned about neutrons yet uh, is that they have something called spin, which uh, gives them a magnetic moment. And this is kind of hard to understand because I mentioned earlier that neutrons uh, have no net electrical charge, so it's kind of bizarre that they would have this magnetic moment. But in fact, they do. They have a spin one half just like a, an electron does or something. They're called fermions, uh, to detail. Um, so you can study magnetic materials with neutrons. And then finally, unlike x-rays, neutrons don't damage your sample with harmful radiation. So not a lot, there are disadvantages to neutrons. Um, the biggest one being that you need to build either a nuclear reactor or a particle accelerator, um, which isn't cheap and it's not easy. So this is an immediate uh, wall that you need to overcome. Um, secondly, time is a big issue. Because neutrons interact so weakly with matter, uh, remember I, I said that they interact with the, the nucleus, and you saw how much empty space is in matter. Uh, the electrons and the nucleus are separated by vast amounts of nothing. And so the neutron interacts with the nucleus, which is on the order of a femtometer, which is a billion or a millionth of a billionth of a meter, so very small distances. And so neutrons pass through matter very easily, uh, regardless of cross section in some cases. So you need to wait around for a long time before you get a scattering event. The probability isn't very high that you're going to get a, a scattering from um, your material with neutrons, so you got to wait a while. And thirdly, uh, often you work with single crystals, or even if you're not really working with these things called single crystals, you need large sample sizes. For the same reason that I just said, that neutrons don't interact strongly with matter. So if you can put a lot of sample in between the neutron and the detector, then the chances of it scattering increase. So you need large samples. But this might be a problem for somebody that's trying to do a single crystal, because uh, it's not very easy to do a large single crystal. So there are some disadvantages. So the interference of waves. So we're going back, we're going to have the idea in our head now that neutrons are not particles, but they're, they're waves. Well, they're, they're both, but we're going to treat them as waves. Um, and there's two main uh, interference, uh, wave interference here. One is constructive interference, and the other destructive interference. And they sound just as they are. I mean, think of a construction worker who's trying to build something. Um, so constructive interference, they build on top of each other these waves. Destructive interference is just how the sounds, they kill each other. It's very possible that you can have a bunch of waves, but through something called the law of superposition, you add up to these waves and they give you nothing. So you get nothing out of something. That's kind of the fun. But the idea is that with constructive interference, if you have these waves where the crest of one wave matches up with the crest of another wave, you just add them up and then you get a big wave. That's, that's going to give you a lot of signal. Destructive interference, you have the crest of one wave, the trough of another wave, you add them up and you get nothing. You're not going to see anything that much, essentially. And then down here are just some images. You've probably seen these online or in other presentations. They're very, this is a very famous example of uh, watching the ripples of water propagate uh, through water or in the medium. Or anything like that. You throw rocks into a pond and it creates these waves. You throw a lot of rocks in the pond and they create a pile. It creates a lot of waves and they interfere with each other and make pretty neat patterns. But if you can look at the right image, if you're able to kind of uh, oscillate this water in, in phase and with the same amplitude, it's pretty easy to uh, get a pattern like that. And it's just lines of constructive and destructive interference. So cross sections, I kind of mentioned this a little earlier, and I need to give you a little more detail about it. Uh, it, it does get complicated, um, but there's main, really only two types of cross-sections that I really want to emphasize. Uh, there's a scattering cross-section, and there's an absorption cross-section. Um, but 
the idea is that x-rays and neutrons see different things because they interact with uh, different uh, atomic particles, the uh, electrons for the x-rays and the nucleus for the neutrons. And so on the top, if you look at the right figure, the green circles, this is what an x-ray would see. Hydrogen, deuterium, carbon, oxygen goes down to iron, and it grows in size, which is uh, pleasing because I told you that it interacts with the electrons. And so the further you go down the periodic table, the more electrons the elements have, the atoms have, and uh, the greater uh, probability you can get from an x-ray scanning. Uh, neutrons aren't the same way as that. It, it's kind of random for neutrons, as a matter of fact, but it's important to see that hydrogen is actually a really large cross section. So, like I said, a lot of people are interested in studying biological materials or hydrogen storage, maybe because you can see hydrogen neutrons very easily. Um, so it gets complicated. This is just a kind of a table here, one page of a pretty thick booklet of all kinds of cross sections for neutrons. Um, and it depends on energy, too. All these are taken at thermal energy neutrons, which are the neutrons that we're interested in, the ones that we need. Uh, to do experiments with. And on the left column, the first left column, you see the atoms or the elements. And then there's numbers to the right of them. These are different isotopes. So, like I said, the, inter the neutron interacts with the nucleus. And if your nucleus possesses more neutrons, or it's a different isotope, then the scattering is going to be a little different. Uh, and then there goes on to be incoherent scattering cross-sections, <coughs> coherent scattering cross-sections, total cross-sections, absorption cross-sections, so it gets complicated. And here's a, here's a figure where uh, for the top one is the absorption cross-section versus atomic number, which is kind of like just further down the periodic table you go. And these are taken at the top there, it says 2200 meters per second. That's how fast the neutron is moving. That's a thermal neutron energy. The velocity is corresponds to an energy. And this energy is uh, something like 25 millielectron volts, or uh, it has a wavelength of 1.5 or 1.8 angstroms, which is what we need to do experiments with. Uh, and that's pretty chaotic. And down on the bottom is a scattering cross section. Uh, again, it's chaotic. There's not, it's not an obvious pattern there. But hydrogen is way up there. It's at 82 bonds. So that's something else I didn't mention. The unit of cross section. Uh, it's called a barn. Now, a barn is 10 to the minus 28 square meters, very tiny, but uh, again, we're on the, uh, the nuclear, or, yeah, the subatomic level, so uh, that can be actually kind of large. Um, but that name kind of uh, uh, is derived from, well, it's not really derived, it was back in uh, when they were developing nuclear bombs and learning a bunch of nuclear reactions and stuff, uh, nuclear physics was starting to take off. It, one day, one physicist was joking to another physicist and said, you know, the, the uranium cross-section is as big as a block. And for some reason, that stuff. And that is just the standard unit of cross-section now when you talk about nuclear physics. So one barn is 10 to the minus 28 square meters. And here, hydrogen, here, here's barns on the, on the y-axis. Nitrogen is like 12 hydrogens all the way to 82. So a huge cross-section. Um, so now, elastic and inelastic neutron scattering. You've probably heard these words before, and if you took a uh, intro physics class, you do a lot of elastic or inelastic collisions. It's the same thing. Um, elastic scattering uh, gives you information on structure. And an important uh, idea about elastic scattering is that uh, the initial energy of your neutron is equal to its final energy. It doesn't change energy. But it can change its momentum. Uh, and momentum is a vector. So to construct a vector, you need a magnitude and you need a direction. So maybe the magnitude of the momentum doesn't change, because the wavelength of the neutron is pretty much going to be the same. But this direction will change. It's scattered. So there's an angle to it, changing its vector. So it changes its momentum. And elastic collision might be, uh, it's a good analogy. If you were playing billiards uh, and you hit the pool ball off of just the Side of the pool table. It's not flying on any of the walls. Uh, that neutron or that cue ball had the velocity before it hit the wall and it had the same velocity as it after it hit the wall. It just changes the direction. Um, now, inelastic scattering gives you information on dynamics, 
And it's just the opposite of what I said about elastic. Your energy of the neutron changes. You either it can give up energy or it can gain energy from the nucleus that it interacts with. And again, you can go back to the billiards analogy, which is quite common. You just hit the cue ball into a bunch of other balls, and the cue ball stops and gives off all of its energy to these other balls. And that gives you information on the end. So elastic scattering gives you structural information, and elastic scattering gives you dynamics. Dynamics being the, how your atoms are moving around in your sample, or more specifically, how the nuclei are moving around in your sample. The neutrons are around the nucleus. Um, what kind of neutron experiments are out there? A lot. There's a lot of different instruments and many different types of uh, experiments you can come up with. Um, here's a bunch of instruments at the SNS Distillation Neutron Source in Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, but here's a bunch of instruments at the High Flux Isotope Reactor. That's also at Oak Ridge National Lab. And here's a bunch of instruments at the NIST Center for Neutron Research. That's in Gatlinburg, Maryland. So um, I'm not going to keep going on with slides and pictures of instruments because we'd be here all day. Instead, I'm going to pick out just a couple different types of uh, experiments and instruments that you can use for these um, that I think is a nice segue into uh, my last section of the talk, which is my research. So these two types of uh, measurements are neutron diffraction, which is an elastic technique, and quasi-elastic neutron scattering. You might wonder why I have quasi-elastic. Is that a typo or anything like that? I didn't mention quasi-elastic scattering. But it's kind of a hybrid between elastic and inelastic scattering. The bottom line is that it gives you information on uh, dynamics. So I have two different types of uh, experiments we can do. Diffraction will give you information on structure, and uh, quasi-elastic neutron scattering will give you information on dynamics, such as translational, rotational, or vibrational. The so neutron diffraction. Uh, neutron diffraction, like I said, is an elastic technique. And it's used to gain information about the positions of atoms or small molecules in your sample. Uh, on the left is a photo of William Bragg and William Bragg, their father and son. Um, they developed something called Bragg's Law. And I use this just about every other day. Bragg's Law. They won the Nobel Prize in 1953. And it relates lambda's wavelength, so it relates the wavelength of a particle to the atomic spacing in your sample and at which direction it scatters. <coughs> so two is just uh, the constant, but D is the distance between atoms and the crystal, for example. And beta is the angle at which it scatters from. Um, and on the, on the right here, uh, okay, so they won that Nobel Prize in 1950, and they did extra scattering. Um, they did extra scattering from zinc oxides and diamond and a few other crystals. And it wasn't until 1945 that the first neutron diffraction measurements were taken. They were taken by this guy named Ernest Wollen uh, at the graphite reactor at Oak Ridge. Um, and a year later, he was joined by uh, Clifford Scholl, who together they helped build basic principles and build up uh, neutron diffraction, and they applied it to all kinds of materials. And decades later, uh, Clifford Scholl split the <laughs> Nobel Prize with uh, the guy Brockhouse, who uh, they worked very closely together. Clifford Scholl developed a lot of diffraction <coughs> techniques, so he did a lot of structural work, and Brockhouse did a lot of uh, dynamic work. Together they shared the Nobel Prize in 1994. <laughs> this, this is really funny. If anybody's ever written a proposal or uh, a beam time uh, proposal for an experiment, Usually it's many pages long and you have preliminary data and you got to convince them that you need to use their instrument. But here's a letter that uh, Ernest Wollen wrote. Uh, I would like to attempt to measure the diffraction of neutrons by a single crystal. I've brought some equipment with me from Chicago and Dr. Bross has shown me an opening in the pile at which my work can be done. This work can be done. I would appreciate obtaining approval to go ahead with this experiment. And that's all it took for him to get going and do the diffraction experiment. And by a hole in the pile, or an opening in the piles, there was this really hole in the reactor there that he could set his instrument in and get neutrons to use for experiment. So I keep talking about neutron diffraction, but what do you actually see in a diffraction experiment? Uh, you see patterns that look like this. And on the y-axis is intensity, uh, on the x-axis is scattering angle. And 
This intensity is achieved through constructive interference. So like I said, the neutrons have waves. If these waves line up, they add it together. And at certain angles, you'll get a lot of these waves that add together, and they show up in the form of peaks here. And these are not experimental uh, figures. They're, they were generated through uh, the software that you could kind of tell the peak spacing, the comic spacing, and other things. But uh, these patterns, these would be expected patterns for something called hexagonal ice. And we all know what ice is, it's just frozen water. Um, and, but hexagonal ice is special because it takes on the shapes of hexagons, and they are in sheets, and they can grow up together. Uh, they can take a couple different uh, kinds of patterns. Uh, but that's what that would be. That would be hexagonal ice. And both of these patterns are for for ice, but uh, one they look they look completely different. They're both for hexagonal ice. And why is that? They one the one on the top is taken with just regular H2O. And hydrogen is just a proton with electron orbiting it. The one on the bottom is taken with T2O, which is this heavy water, which is just a hydrogen ion, so a hydrogen nucleus with a uh, proton or uh, with a neutron in there. And it's just crazy how vastly different they are. They're the same element, but they produce different diffraction patterns of neutrons. So quasi elastic neutron scattering. And this isn't uh, easy to understand, it's not easy to explain either. Uh, but the bottom line that I want to get across, uh, the point I want to get across to all of you is that it helps you measure dynamics. You can get an understanding of diffusion of your molecules or your atoms in the material. Um, and like I said, with the, uh, the elastic and inelastic, elastic has no energy transfer. The neutron has the same energy before the collision and after the collision. And that's where this really big peak is on the left figure here, this elastic peak. It's centered at the zero energy transfer because the neutron get energy to the energy. But when you work any left and then any elastic experiment, the neutron either gains energy or it loses energy. And that would be out there. But when you do a quasi-elastic scattering, the neutron does gain or lose energy, but it doesn't, it's very, very small the amount of energy that we're talking about. And so it sits really close to this elastic peak, and we just call it quasi-elastic, not exactly elastic. Um, and on the on the right here is a theoretical quasi-elastic spectra or spectrum as a function of momentum and energy transfer. This this function is s of q omega. This q you can think of has information about momentum, and the omega has information about energy. And so if you can obtain uh, a function that has information on both momentum and energy, you begin to get a lot of, uh, you, do, you get a really good feel about what your material is doing. Uh, this has a few omega is called the dynamic structure factors. It's important to do this practice. So, my research and my experience in neutron scanning. Um, here at the zoo, um, there's a few different groups in the physics department. Uh, a couple different people are working on different things, but together we're using neutron scattering. Um, there's a group, a hydrogen storage group, interested in understanding how hydrogen would fill materials, um, how fast it would fill materials, how large the materials get when it's filled with hydrogen, and this would be used eventually for uh, an alternative fuel source. Uh, and then there's also biological research going on, biophysics, because of the luxury <coughs> of these neutrons that have not damaged your sample and also see lighter elements, you can study biology. Um, so I, I'm more into the biological physics uh, side of it, and specifically we look at um, the structure of water and the motion of water around cellular membranes, cellular lipid membranes. And what is a membrane? Everybody knows what a cell is, um, and it's surrounded by a membrane, a protective membrane. <coughs> and this membrane is made up of something called lipids. And these lipids are tiny little molecules uh, that have a hydrophilic head group and, a hydro and two hydrophobic tails. Hydrophilic means that it likes water. Hydrophobic means it doesn't like water. <coughs> and so when these lipids get together, they like to form structures like this down in the bottom right, where you have the head groups uh, separated and the tails in between. The tails want to get away from the water, the head groups want to go towards the water. So they make these uh, bilayers, we call them. And so, Cellular membranes are way too complex for us to study. We need to simplify it. And so we get rid of the proteins, we get rid of the cholesterols and all this other stuff, and we make 
a bilayer lipid membrane. That's what this figure is here. And we look at two different types of lipid species. One is called DMPG, and the other is called DMPC. And we construct them in these, this planar geometry here, which is just a bilayer, and it has water on both top and bottom of it, and it's supported on what we call a substrate. And the question that we have is that <coughs> we, we want to know how the behavior of water differs in the two membrane systems. And by behavior, I uh, specifically mean the freezing of water, but you can also uh, achieve information on dynamics. And so we have, say we have two different samples, a DMPC in one sample, a DMPG in another sample. And these lipid molecules are very similar, and they differ only in one place. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, these types of uh, figures, these tooth-like, uh, these sawtooth kind of pattern represents just carbon atoms with hydrogen on them. And so these are the two tails, and they're identical for the, both, both the molecules. They have 14 carbons in their tails. Um, and then these colored circles are their head groups, and their head groups are made up of different uh, domains or regions, and uh, they both have this glycerol backbone. They both are made of this phosphate group here. But where they differ is in the very end. These terminal groups are called the DMPC. You have this choline terminal group, which has a positive charge, and when it comes in contact with this phosphate group, which has a negative charge, it renders the entire lipid neutral. Uh, now, in the case of the DMPG, uh, it has a glycerol terminal group, which doesn't possess a charge, and when it comes in contact with phosphate, uh, it, it remains net negative. And so, important thing to understand is that DMPC is positive, and DMPG is negative. And they both have these horrible chemical names that I can hardly pronounce. Um, now, we use something called inelastic, or uh, elastic incoherent neutron scanner. And we performed measurements on the high flux fast scanner spectrometer at NIST, Center for Neutron Research. Uh, this is in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And this instrument has an energy resolution of one micro electron volt. And it corresponds to a time scale of four nanoseconds. Now, that's a mouthful, but all you need to understand is that uh, this four nanoseconds, keep this in mind, four nanoseconds. And that's a nanosecond is one billionth of a second. And Remember, I mentioned that these cross sections they get really confusing and a uh, really long list of isotopes and things. But if you're clever and you kind of smart people to work with, they can we can figure out which kind of cross sections we need to look up. And in this case, we need to get some incoherent scattering cross sections. And here's a table of some of the isotopes. <coughs> and hydrogen by far has the largest uh, incoherent cross section. And so all the signal that you get is going to be due to hydrogen. Um, and then, like I said, we need really big samples because we have to count for a long time and we want to increase the probability of the scattering events. So um, we take our samples, uh, which is a substrate with five layers on top and bottom of it. We stack them 100 high, put them in an aluminum sample cell, put a drop of water in there, and seal it up. And then launch a bunch of neutrons there. Now, here's a plot. Here's an elastic incoherent uh, some elastic incoherent data from DMPC, the neutral lipid. And on the y-axis here is intensity. This is called elastic intensity. And this elastic intensity is proportional to the amount of hydrogen nuclei that are moving on a time scale longer than four nanoseconds. That four nanoseconds, that's a mouthful too, but all it really means is that when you see an increase in the intensity, the water is immobile, or it's frozen. The nuclei are not moving uh, as fast, uh, on a time scale fast enough for the instrument to see, essentially. So it means water froze. And I'm on a Kelvin scale here. So at 273 Kelvin, this is zero degrees Celsius. So this is the freezing point of water, or cold water. But uh, here, our water doesn't freeze at 273. It doesn't freeze until about 265 Kelvin. Not only that, but when it does freeze, it freezes pretty quickly. Almost two thirds of the water is frozen at this point, um, which is evidence of some called phase transition. And you, you're all familiar with phase transition, uh, ice cube melting into liquid, gas, uh, or water boiling into steam or something. So it's changing its phase. 
So we're going from a liquid to a solid. And then it continuously increases in this intensity and it levels off way down there at uh, 255 or 250 Kelvin, which means that all the water is now frozen in the sample. So what do we like to do when we have a frozen sample? We like to heat it back up. And it doesn't follow the same curve anymore. It has a hysteresis to it. And there's not much going on here. It's not too exciting, really. I mean, it's flat. Uh, but it does all melt below this 273 Kelvin right below. And so this kind of suggests that it is bulk water. It behaves just like ordinary water does. Now, this was the neutral liquid. And the temperature scale here, it levels off at about 255, this elastic signal. Now, if you look at the negatively charged liquid, the DMPG, it doesn't level off until like 200 Kelvin or so, even further down there. Uh, it still has the same effect where it doesn't freeze at 273 Kelvin, but it has these regions of continuous freezing. I mean, it has different slopes to them. Kind of tells us that different uh, regions of water in our system freeze at different temperatures and on different uh, time scales. Um, and there is no sharp increase in the elastic signal, kind of suggesting that there's no phase transition here. It's all kind of just a continuous freezing, which maybe it's amorphous. Uh, amorphous means uh, a a solid that doesn't have any preferred orientation. All the molecules are frozen, but they're not in any sort of crystal form. Uh, now, the most interesting part about this whole idea is that when you heat this up, you get quite a pretty looking heating curve. It's got a lot of structure to it. It's pretty interesting. Uh, it takes a while to <coughs> for it to be drastic. But there's regions of water that are melting at different temperatures here. And uh, this is just absolutely absent in the neutral piece. So we're not really sure what's going on here. We need to do a little bit of analysis, but you can kind of think about it. Of course, it, it, it behaves differently. Uh, it's a net negatively charged lipid versus a neutral lipid. And then just to bring the idea home for you, it's probably on the same temperature scale here. Uh, it's just overwhelming how qualitatively different these two samples are. And the only difference is in that terminal group, the lipids are uh, everywhere else are the same. Um, so you thought maybe you'd get away without seeing any math. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about this math really, it's just there for clarification. But uh, this is quasi elastic neutron scale. And it's not, it's not easy to understand, it's hard to explain, but you're after this S, this S diffusion, this is your dynamic structure factor. And you obtain it through fitting a bunch of quasi-elastic spectrums. Uh, for example, on the uh, left here is uh, just a typical image of what you would expect in a quasi-elastic experiment. And then you work together and uh, bounce ideas off each other, use the right model, you can end up fitting the spectras and obtaining diffusion constants. And diffusion constants are just fancy way of saying how fast something <coughs> And so the plot on the right is diffusion constant versus temperature, and the triangles, the green and the blue triangles, are bulk light water, just your everyday water. And these are uh, how fast the, mol the water molecules are living. And it's kind of linear and it, it, with all these data points, and it, it's intuitively pleasing to see that it increases with increasing temperature, because you imagine you heat up water, uh, you're giving more energy to the water molecules, they move around faster, so the diffusion constant would be higher, more fast, higher temperature. Um, now on the bottom here, the red and the black circles, these are the results of the DMPC, the neutral lipid system. And they don't have this linear shape to them, they have these steps, these little pumps in them. Not only that, but it's lower than bulk water, so they're moving slower than just regular water. Um, so the water in the DMPC system and it has these humps to it. So at one temperature, it's moving at a pretty nice speed, but you just increase the temperature a little bit, and all of a sudden, it's moving much faster. So this is an example of what we do um, with quasi-elastic data, is obtain the beauty constants, which tells us, about, uh, which tells us how fast our molecules are moving. And future work, we have a lot of ideas that we'd like to do. Um, this DMPG, the net negative charge lipid, uh, we also have quasi-elastic data for that, but 
it's hard to fit, it takes a long time. Uh, so we're in the progress of fitting this data and seeing how it compares to the DNPC case. Um, on the right hand side uh, are diffraction experiments. Currently, we're doing diffraction experiments on the DNPC system. We're kind of curious if this water has any structure to it. We think it's hexagonal ice that freezes really quickly. Um, and then the DMPG case, uh, we're not so sure what to expect. Maybe it's amorphous ice. Uh, but you can confirm this by doing neutron diffraction. You slowly cool your sample down, you take a neutron diffraction patterns at each temperature, and you'd be able to see these peaks appear. Because once the water freezes, it will freeze in a crystal structure if it does. And if it does, it will give you peaks in your diffraction pattern. So the, the, we're doing this too. And for the long term uh, project, uh, we were working with these lipid membranes and everything like that, but uh, it's very simple. The, we want to make it more physiological, give it more relevance to life and everything. Uh, so we'll take this simple system, which is just our bio-layer, and we'll move a step closer to a uh, more physiological state, which would mean insert something else into it, other, other lipids or cholesterols, but we're thinking that we'll take the protein Root and enter uh, something called alpha amylase, just some easy to work with protein. We'll insert it in our membranes and uh, also take quasi-elastic data, see how the diffusion of water compares to our already pretty well understood uh, system without any protein. Um, so, in summary, thermal neutrons <coughs> have wavelengths that are comparable to the interatomic distances of matter <coughs> and has energies similar to the excitation. Matter. And so you can understand, or you can obtain information on structure, and you can obtain information on dynamics. Um, there are countless types of instrumentation available for neutron scattering, and I really, if you're interested, I encourage you to just go to some national website, national lab websites, and they're terrific on that. They have instrument documents, pictures, and uh, contact information. It's a, it's a really big field. Um, so neutron scattering could be applied to just about every branch of uh, science that spills over into engineering. Uh, and by manipulating the isotopes in a sample, it's possible to create contrast between the same elements which make up the material. Uh, because the neutron interacts with the nucleus, and you can manipulate how it interacts. Uh, for example, in that fraction pattern I showed you with the hexagonal ice, you get different data depending on which isotope you're dealing with. Um, so some acknowledgments. The uh, Iger program, uh, which is funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, Support me in my research. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Angel Speck for having me here. And then my research group, my advisor, Dr. Pascal Pop, my supervisor at the research director, Dr. Helen Kaiser, and then our senior uh, graduate <coughs> Andrew Scow. So with that, thanks. Each kind of interaction causes the scattering. Is it a spin spin or an interaction? It's it depends on the spin state of the nucleus. And it's it's incredibly hard to determine theoretically as, as far as I understand. Um, all of the uh, to determine the cross section and how strong something will scatter is determined experimentally for the most part. Um, because it's so chaotic down there. And all, the best answer I have for you is that it interacts with the nucleus via, uh, because of the spin state. Of the nucleus. So it's in the spin function, some kind of? It must be, yeah. yeah. So there should be some interaction, right? Because, so is it finally the answer is? So <laughs> I, I, would, I would lean to the spin spin interaction. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank Dr. again. And uh, I'm hoping it's cloudy outside, so the alert key will not be open. <laughs> Good job.